Hello, my name is Kyle Eisenhut, and today I'm going to be presenting on the doctrine of the Imago Dei, also known as the image of God. The reason I chose this is because I've been very involved in the pro-life movement. And as I'm going to talk about a little later in the presentation, there's a big connection between the pro-life cause and the Imago Dei, although that's certainly not all of it, and you guys get to figure out why that is. So if you look here too, this is a painting by Michelangelo, or at least a modification of it called The Creation of Adam, and it's kind of depicting how man is created in the image of God. So I thought it was a good picture. So a short definition is that Imago Dei is Latin for image of God, which I alluded to earlier. It doesn't get much simpler than that, but it can get more complicated. This longer definition comes to us from pbs.org. And how they work is, I thought this was kind of more of a, a fair definition. It um, didn't really pick sides, because there's a lot of different nuance, different ways that people look at the image of God. Um, so what this says is it's a theological term applied uniquely to humans that denotes a symbolic relation between God and humanity. It has roots in that Bible verse, which we're going to talk about um, in the next slide or two. Um, and really, it's talking about how humans mirror God's divinity and their ability to actualize unique qualities that, um, that they've been made like. And that's a quality that John Calvin talks about, um, which also we're going to be talking about later. Um, don't want to spend too much time on that, because we got a lot of good stuff to talk about here tonight. So, what is the biblical foundation? My favorite book. Well, it's all rooted in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, which says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So that's really everything that we're going to be talking about in the remainder of this presentation is going to be coming from that Bible verse. There's a lot of doctrines, there's been a lot of thought, a lot of whatever you want to call it, poured over these verses. And in fact, there's other verses in the Bible that are centered around what this says. When God said, let us make human beings in our image. So, that is the biblical, really the foundation of the foundation. But there's more that the Bible talks about when it comes to the image of God. So where else besides that first quote do we find it? Well, you see in a lot of different areas, um, and these are not the only four areas that the image of God is referenced or alluded to in. There's actually more than this, and sometimes it also depends on what translation you decide to use. For example, when we go down to Colossians 3.10, which is a teaching on being a new creation, the idea that we're transformed when we come to know Christ. It references pretty much exactly the image of God with the um, NRSV version of the Bible. But you see, if you're reading the NLT, which is what I, you know, that's my version I read, you would probably miss the idea of being made in the image of God just because there's a couple different uses of the word. And so, there's other things you could have missed, but you see, this is also a very wide variety of what happens. In Genesis 5, we have a genealogy from Adam to Noah. And that's very different than just a couple chapters later in Genesis, when you have a verse that's talking about the seriousness of murder. And that verse is actually disputed as far as the uh, actual meaning of it, um, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the image of God. And then I talked about Colossians, but then James, it's teaching about the danger of the tongue and how we need to treat everyone in a way that's honoring of how they were made and who their creator is. And so while all these have roots in that initial scripture in Genesis 1, you see this is a very wide variety of applications and different uses in the Bible. Um, but what would a good Bible verse be if there weren't a lot of people who thought a lot about it? 
You see, this guy right here is Thomas Aquinas. He's a famous theologian. Um, and he says that the Imago Dei exists mainly in your intellect, with your reasoning. Um, and in his mind, that is why angels have more of the image of God than man, but also why people possess the image of God, whereas animals don't even have it. Um, and some of these thinkings um, are found in Catholic thought. In fact, if you look at how Catholics view the Imago Dei, it's almost all um, from Thomas Aquinas. And he also talks a lot about the stages of the Imago Dei. Stage one says that everyone possesses the image of God because we're all created by God. And stage two is those who know and love God. And then stage three is those who know God and love God perfectly. And you might be asking, who can even make it to stage three, which has also been a lot of thought. But this is kind of how Thomas Aquinas viewed the different stages of the image of God. Another theologian who has a lot of weight um, in this conversation is John Calvin. And what he did was he rejected the idea that there is a difference between likeness and image. And that might seem like a very small distinction to make, but it's actually quite a significant one. Um, and a big thing of his was the difference between before the fall of man and then after the fall of man. And what he compared it to it was a bit of a metaphor. He said that when man sinned originally, it was like the mirror had been broken. You could still see the image, but it was marred. It wasn't the perfect image that it was before. Uh, and what he did was it distinguished him from earlier theologians, such as Aquinas or Irenaeus. And any talk about theologians would be incomplete without our buddy, John Wesley. We love him here at Asbury. And what he said, and this is different than what Aquinas said, instead of three aspects, he said, or instead of three stages, he said there's three aspects of the image of God. You have the natural image, the political, and the moral. And those involve different things, and um, we're not going to do too much on them, but you see there's different nuances to the image of God. People take this to different levels. They view it in slightly different ways, but it all goes back to that original passage in Genesis that says we are all made in the image of God. He's our creator, and there's value that we have because of that. But what Wesley is kind of distinctive for, especially if you compare him to John Calvin, is he closely related to the Imago Dei to the idea of salvation. Wesley and Wesleyans for the centuries since have truly believed that all people are capable of being saved. That Jesus died on the cross so that everyone would have the opportunity to come to know him. And he said, because we're made in the image of God, that means Christ died for all. And so while, you know, you might not think that those two things are related, it's really the crux of a lot of his belief in that. And there's certainly other reasons he believed that. And there's a lot of different other um, theological points and arguments that could be made surrounding that issue. But really, it is uh, based a lot in the Imago Dei. And I think really you could tie a lot of doctrines of Christianity to this idea of the image of God. And specifically, another guy we love is Thomas Oden. We read his book, had a lot of good things to say. Um, hopefully we read his book, right? But anyway, he had this idea that creation is fundamentally good. And really this idea was borrowed from Calvin in a way. Because Calvin thought creation was fundamentally good before the fall. And that's really what Odin would say too. Um, and then sin, of course, marred the image of God. Um, and he also borrowed a little bit from Aquinas too. When he said the image of God distinguishes people from creation. We're not just animals walking around, but we have intrinsic value because we are people. Um, and I think that's all we're going to say about that one. So next, we have some practical application. But I truly believe we need to think a little bit about history. Now, 
If you, I don't know if you recognize this picture, it might be a little blurry for you guys. But this are the two supposed founders of the city of Rome. Now, the other thing before we get into that is a statement that might seem a little out of place. Infanticide was quite common in the Greco-Roman world. And just a reminder that infanticide is the killing of infants. Now, it's a bit of a Debbie Downer, but it was quite a common practice. And as I told you, I was very involved in the pro-life movement um, for many years, many a long time, and um, infanticide was kind of a side issue of that. And it was a common thing and actually integral to how Rome, what I was talking about with this picture, how it was founded. The story goes that there was a king in the Roman area, and he had a daughter and sons, but then the king's brother overthrew him, killing the original king's son, sons, but then deciding not to kill his daughter. And instead, he sent his daughter to be a priestess, a vestal virgin, as they were called, one of these Roman gods, they were polytheistic, they had so many gods. But these Vestal Virgins were required in the name to be celibate. Well, one way or the other, his daughter got pregnant. She said it was one of the Roman gods who impregnated her. And the new king, her uncle, was too scared to kill her, so we put her in prison. When her babies were born, he said they need to die, because that probably would be a challenge to his throne, but... He, was, uh, he put the orders out to kill these babies, but the person who he asked to do it was too scared of the gods. And so what he did, and this is very common to the story of Moses, was he put the twins in a little basket in the Tigris River, which runs through Rome, and sent them away and said, we're going to let the elements do their trick. Well, the story goes that they were then raised by a wolf and fed by a woodpecker, until some farmers found them and raised them from there. The reason I share this story is that in the much of the Old Testament and intertestimonial period, you had Rome that was very powerful. And certainly in the New Testament, it, everything that we hear about in the Bible, they were living in the Roman Empire. In the very foundation, the story that is their very beginning involves infanticide of all these babies being left to die. Now, this was not only a story of these two, it was quite a common practice. In fact, in the Roman Empire, if your baby had a physical disability, you were required by law to kill them. If the father of the house, or whoever the head of the household was, said they didn't want the baby, the baby would be left out in the elements to die. The Jews were very much against this practice, but they didn't really do a whole lot about it besides complaining. But what changed was when the Christians came around, they would rescue these babies. Even though it was against the law, they would risk their own lives to care for these babies, rescuing them in the dead of night. In fact, they became known for rescuing the babies with disabilities in particular. Eventually, churches even became drop-off locations for unwanted children. This is our history. Christians have stood up against infanticide. Which brings us to today, we have more of the pro-life movement. Now it's kind of a sad statistic, I don't know if you guys can see it super well, but there's over 2,000 abortions in America every single day. And I find this very sad. Thomas Oden, who I talked about a little earlier, said that the signs of the church include, and I'm going to read it here, pastoral care, to preserve doctrine and works of mercy. And that was abbreviated a little bit. But what are we doing as a church to care for post-abortive mothers? What are we doing to defend the church's long-standing opposition to abortion and infanticide in this country? And what are we doing to care for those facing crisis pregnancies? And what are we doing to defend the unborn? When all 2,000 Babies are dying every single day. A way for, I'm not going to just complain about it or bring it to your attention, but I think a solution is that there's over 2,000 pregnancy centers all across the country right now. These centers provide free ultrasounds, they provide free pregnancy tests, they provide prenatal vitamins, counseling if you've had an abortion, 
amongst other services, depending on center to center. Churches can help in a number of ways. They can donate their time. They can donate their money. I know, for instance, that male volunteers are particularly needed because the boyfriends and the husbands are often persuading the mothers to abort or often the ones kind of pushing them towards it or they just don't care. And so when you have the men in there, it can get those fathers of the baby to stand up or even take an interest in their child. And I could say a lot more about that, but we're going to move on to another practical application is interracial cooperation. Anytime we talk about race, we can get a little controversial, but I think it's still an important issue that we have to talk about. You know, racism has changed a lot in this country in the last 60 years. In many ways, you had racism that was outright and open, no bones about it. But now what you often have is racism that's done accidentally. And I think one thing that we as churches can do is educate our congregants about what is okay and what is not okay. Because many of them would never say something, they would never do something, if they knew it would be offensive or hurtful to that other person. And another thing which could be controversial is, I think we need to affirm interracial relationships. In 2010, only 36% of white Americans and only 59% of black Americans who were over 65 said they would be okay if someone in their family married outside their race. These numbers were better amongst people under 30 with 88% um, of white people, 85% of black, but 81% of Hispanic people under 30, saying they'd be okay with that. That means in our churches, there might be a majority of our older saints who aren't okay if an interracial couple visits their church. And I think this is unacceptable. We need to affirm the Imago Dei in all people, regardless of whether they look like us, or share our skin colors, or if they even don't share each other's skin colors, we need to acknowledge they were created in the image of God. And Odin says, another good Odin quote, the church is gathered by one Lord through one baptism into one mystical body under one head governed by one spirit bound together in the unity of a common faith, hope, and love. And this is the why behind why should we acknowledge the Imago Dei in all people. And I think another point is we have to acknowledge the systemic racism that exists in our country. You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, equal opportunity, not equal outcome. And I'm sure many of you would agree with that. However, there are challenges that some people face that white people don't have to face themselves because of stuff that happened generations ago that has not been able to be resolved because poverty is not something that's always a quick fix. Now, past personal application, um, you know, I was president of Liberty's pro-life movement. We, uh, I alluded to that earlier, and there's lots of different things we did with that. Um, we're not going to, you know, talk about that forever, but um, we would counsel people going into the abortion clinics in a loving way. We would advocate for pregnant and parenting students on campus. I was integral in changing a policy that said if you got pregnant while living on campus, you were evicted from your housing. And we said, that seems like that's encouraging more secret abortions than it is encouraging purity. And we also believe in forgiveness <laughs> as Christians. And so we changed that policy. We educated people about what's actually going on. Because people have no idea about the development of a baby until you tell them a lot of times. And we did a lot of fundraising, including for those um, pregnancy resource centers, which I alluded to a few slides earlier. Now, if we go to some present applications, if you haven't been able to tell, I'm in my living room right now, in front of our TV, and the person filming is my mom. <laughs> you see, we're here with COVID-19. That's why I can't present to you in person. So how can we acknowledge the Imago Dei when we can't even leave our house? But what we can do is we can model Christ to those we're living with. To our, for me, it would be my parents and my sisters. How am I treating them? Am I showing them God's love? Am I acknowledging that they're created in the image of God? Um, 
you know, by the way I'm acting in this house? Or am I being a grunt? And I guess the jury's still out. I don't know if I'm doing that perfectly. But, um, you know, I think that's a good practical application in that picture. My parents at their new office with the dog sleeping on the chair, you can just kind of blend in. Um, but also moving on to our, our last slide here, we have a future personal application. Many of us at seminary are in the same boat, although we have different callings and things that we plan on doing with our lives or uh, we're already doing with our lives, some of us. But I feel called to work as a pastor. I'm currently a candidate for ministry in the UMC. And one thing I learned my undergrad was in business. One of the things we learned was there's positional power. As a pastor, I'm going to have influence that others don't. And I can draw attention to disenfranchised groups and equip my congregants to be the hands and feet of Christ in a way that many people don't have the opportunity to do in their lives. And that's a tremendous responsibility. That's a way that I can show people how do we acknowledge the image of God in other people. In modeling that through behavior, you ought to practice what you preach. How am I treating other people? How am I treating those disenfranchised groups? How am I showing those acts of mercy that Thomas Oden talked about? Modeling it through my behavior is going to be so important. So as we think about the image of God, we think about the biblical application, theological, we talked a little bit about history, we talked about um, practical application, personal application, there's a lot of different ways you can look at this. But at the end of the day, it all goes back to that Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, that God created us in his own image. Thank you for listening, and have a great, for me it's a night, or for you whenever you're listening.